remember that's the moment. You've got about eight hours maximum from that moment, from the moment of, of occlusion until you get irreversible necrosis. Welcome to the Aesthetics Mastery Show. I'm Dr. Tim Pierce. Hi, I'm Miranda Pierce. And today we're looking at when good clinicians get catastrophically bad outcomes from complications for some very interesting reasons I don't think people think about a lot. I recently interviewed a responsible good clinician who took all the action that she would have thought was necessary at the time with reasonable training and got a very bad complication at the end. And I was thinking as we discussed this as part of my Complications Mastery program, we went through every detail of that case and there's so much learning, but a lot of it is around the concepts other than how do you get the diagnosis right and how do you do the treatment? There is a lot of other stuff that can completely change the outcome and that's what I want to, want to talk about today. So it's a bit like from my perspective, when you something goes wrong in your life and you think to yourself, the reason that went wrong is because a series of hideous stars aligned and just everything went wrong at once. But how does that even begin? How does that, how does that, where does that start? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's an analogy. Both of us once were saw independently saw two different health and safety lectures, didn't we? And they used <laughs> this the analogy of the Swiss cheese, which is all the holes need to align for something really bad to happen. Um, I actually quite like the analogy of a lock. Um, if you ever look inside a lock, which hopefully we'll get a picture of to show people, what actually happens when you unlock something with a key is that the key pushes up these little pins. All of them have to be at exactly the right level and then you can unlock the lock. Unfortunately, what we're doing is unlocking a little mini catastrophe when it comes to these really serious complications. But what I've noticed by dissecting these cases, which as you know, I do that for the Complications Mastery Program where we interview either a patient or a clinician and go in depth um, into the case to figure out all the different bits of learning we can get um, that could have gone wrong. So we've been doing that for a while and recently I interviewed someone who had a really bad complication with a nose. This is a good studious clinician who, who was following guidelines and still got a really, really bad outcome. Uh, and we discussed this openly. I, I mean, obviously she's not gonna put it on social media, but I'm so grateful for people who do share that kind of thing. Um, and I'm gonna share some of the broader principles today so that you can all think a bit more clearly around the types of things that put a good clinician off course um, when they're doing their best and really bad outcomes can still happen. Um, so that's, that's the key. It's almost like you're you're walking in the woods or something, and the cut you come to a fork in the road, and you've got to. This is what happens in real life case studies of when bad things go wrong clinically, and you have a choice to. Do you think? Oh, you shared actually with your first VO, uh, where there was a moment actually it was before the Easter weekend, and you kind of thought, oh, it'll be fine, and then you thought, no, go back and check, and that was a fork in the road where you had the chance to go go wrong and you yeah. didn't. So absolutely. So in between you seeing a patient, getting the diagnosis correct and rescuing them, there are probably about 150 forks in the road. And each one of them is a little mini challenge about to block you from getting the right answer. And just by understanding the types of problems that present themselves and how it can sway you in a different direction, you'll be more on your guard. And as, as you rightly pointed out, the first one is your own inner desire not to have to deal with the vascular occlusion <laughs> because they never happen. A bit like children, they never arrive, you know, when when your life is peaceful and yeah. calm and you've got plenty of time to deal with it. Uh, it never feels like the right time. So um, that that's the first, one of the many aspects that can knock people off course, but there are actually many much more, almost more mundane things. Um, one of the examples I've come across recently would be uh, running out of a particular size of cannula. So just switching to a different size cannula um, for some people, it makes well, it makes it more likely if that cannula is a bit smaller. It's one of the one of the parts of this case was maybe using a different size cannula. Now, of course, you never know for sure whether that was a deciding factor, but it was certainly one less thing in favour of not having the complication in the first place. So, and I know this is a little bit off topic, but why would that be a problem? Well, the smaller a cannula it is, the sharper it is. So the closer it gets to being effectively like a needle. But the downside with cannulas is they're much longer. They tend to stay in the same place for much more, which means the size of the occlusion is much more. So unfortunately, cannulas often are perceived as much safer and they probably are 
less likely to cause a vascular occlusion, but I'm only thinking from first principles here. But if you do have a vascular occlusion, they're probably a bit more likely to cause a really big vascular occlusion. And that's what happened in this particular case. It was a nose case, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Okay. So, but lots more other interesting stuff that went around that. So I want to talk around, um, particularly the, the emotions. There's, you've already brought up my own emotion at that time when I first had a vascular occlusion was this little question of it'll be fine. Like I wanted to reassure myself. So that would be the first thing I'd say is look out for your own desire to reassure yourself because we all have it. None of us want this to happen to ourselves. So your brain, you know, the, the reticular activating system is always looking for things that are relevant to what it wants. That's how our brains work. And we also have our fears and it also will look for things that it wants to avoid. So you need to just keep that alert in your mind that if you get it wrong at this point and it's another five hours before you see your patient back again, you are already massively on the back foot. So it, just knowing that, if you just by watching this video, you remember that, you're much more likely to be looking for the right things in that situation, knowing that self-deception is something we all do when, when we would like to avoid a, a complication. So, um, when you want to reassure yourself, you look for things that are positive. And we, this is such a human thing to do. Um, it'll be fine. It's very unlikely. I only injected a small amount. Oh, she's um, a worrier. Yeah. So this is the patient psychology, which is, which was also another part of this case. It's not, I mean, you can think of patients as kind of too worrying too much, worrying too little, or maybe somewhere in between. Um, I've already said to, I mean, I remember talking to one of my patients who's very laid back, trust me immensely. So she's, she's always like, oh, I don't, I know you're safe and you're a good practitioner and I'm not worried and I'm not a worrier. And I'm immediately thinking the day she messages me with even one little question, I'm getting her back into the clinic to review because I know that's all true. She's not a worrier, which means if she gives me a small signal, I need to make sure that I react really strongly to that. Whereas I do have other patients who worry about everything and there's a million questions and I'm more likely to take that into account. But there's also a pitfall there, which is you can't disregard them just because they've always been asking you loads and loads of questions because you never know that you need to ask them the precise set of questions that you yeah. would for anyone. And it all comes back to a signal to noise ratio, which is an idea I want to kind of, um, bring up in this podcast quite a lot, which is the idea that there's, there are certain things that, that outweigh everything else that you need to search for and not get blocked by the many, many challenges, which are these little forks on the road. So what is this, the true, the truest signal you can get and how can you be using that to define your, uh, to define your actions apart from all the other human stuff that gets in the way? The noise. The noise. Yeah. So um, some of the other noise, which was also true in this case, was just this, the practicalities of getting the patient back in front of you. And this is this is something that links to the inconvenience as well, which is you have to be ready to be very inconvenienced if you want to be a safe practitioner. I remember saying it to myself, I'm going to be inconvenienced if someone messages me. This is before the days of WhatsApp. So we didn't have the, the luxury of getting you know, a video sent A computer refill. So I, w I was like, okay, I'm going to be inconvenienced three or four times a year. I'm going to go out and check on a nervous mm -hmm. patient who's got a bruise. And I know it's going to be a waste of my time in that instance, but the practice over the year, I might pick up a VO and not have a problem. I think that kind of thing, it sounds small, but it's not, it's so big telling yourself, ah, yes, in the future, this will happen. I always think that when you tell the story about how your VO took an hour and a half to re re um, to reverse, I, I, I that went into my brain as like, oh, right, okay, Dr. Tim, he took an hour and a half. So, that's all, that's what I can expect. And it makes it more normalized. It's good mm. to say it up front. Well, the one before that took 45 minutes. So I was actually starting to get pretty stressed yeah. out by the time I got to an hour and a half. Now I've also know of cases now that have gone on for three or four hours. So um, don't let the time hold you back. Just be aware that it takes time. But it's exactly that kind of thing that makes a big difference. So what we've touched on, um, so I was just going to think of some more mundane things that might make a difference. It could be that your room layout changes. So I've certainly felt this um, working in different venues that's, that suddenly you're doing your injections in a different way. And this can, this can make you do something that you wouldn't normally do. Um, so r little things that are probably okay, you know, particularly if you've got lo loads of experience, you probably know enough, but there was, you know, there have been times when I've kind of leaned over in a more awkward position. Maybe, uh, maybe your angle of entry is not quite as simple as as it would have been with the way you've done 99% of your injections. These are little things that will nudge you into different areas of risk. And you don't always appreciate it until you get a complication. And most times you get away with it, but it's mm. often a factor 
that you've done something different that's unusual to you. Um, different products. So this was also an, another interesting part of this case I reviewed, which is using a different product. Um, certainly just creates an element of doubt. You know, you might do things differently. There's a question mark about how much dissolving agent you need. Maybe if you've always used one product and you know roughly what it takes to dissolve that, and you're suddenly using something totally different. It just creates more uncertainty. Mm. You don't know. You don't have the sense of confidence in, in what you're doing in the same way because it's, it's uncharted territory effectively. Let's say the patient is laid back and they've also put time pressure on you. You know, like I've got, you know, I've got to be, or, you know, you know, I've got, I can't be bruised or, oh, come on, it'll be fine. I, I you Absolutely. know. It's a huge thing. I, often it's, you, we all want our patients to be happy. And they, if they start to get um, angsty, like they just want to move on, um, that's more noise that you've got to separate from the signal because remembering that getting it wrong at this stage causes weeks, months, and even years of real unhappiness. You've got to block out those little drivers to solve the immediate problem and keep your eye on the main goal. Um, it's one of the things I noticed actually, which is my partner, one of, them, uh, one of the VOs we had that I helped with in the clinic had a partner who didn't know she was having treatment. So we were confronting the fact that she was getting more and more anxious that he wouldn't need to know where she was yeah. and then she'd have to come clean and not not just that, but there was also a complication and then he'd be like, I, I told you not to do this, you know, all that, those kind of dynamics. So you, you've got to drown out that noise because that, that noise, if you get swept up in it and she's getting nervous and she's on her phone or he's on her phone messaging and texting and you're like, you really want to avoid that for her because that's suddenly become her main concern. Mm -hmm. You've got to say, look, you you can solve that later. Even if you never have treatment again, let's get you through this with no risk of a scar. Yeah. Because that's a hundred times worse than than the relationship issues that you know, the relate the scar will last quite possibly might last longer than the relationship. So yeah. you've got to think very long term and just remember it as noise. Like, okay, fair enough, you've got relationship problems. My main priority is mm -hmm. making sure you don't you don't scar. And being and just firm. come back to that. Exactly. I, I think and I think that you as clinicians, you know, from my lay perspective, I if a clinician was firm with me, ultimately I would respect that. I'm not gonna start arguing. If you if you say this is the thing we're dealing with now, this is the most important thing, I need you to work with me on this. I think that they will respect that. Yeah. Absolutely. And, but re repeating it's important and just being aware of it because you, you don't want to put yourself in a position when you're already stressed of trying to manage seven different variables, mm -hmm. like what your partner thinks, the traffic, the cost of the taxi to get back here, or all, all of those things become things that make clinicians nudge into a different, uh, a different, different set of behaviors. They're little challenges, as you say, to really getting the medical side completely right. Mm -hmm. And just to be clear, you know, when you, when I told that story of you having a VO and almost wanting it not to be the case, all it took for you to identify that VO or to genuinely reassure yourself that it wasn't, is just to check capillary refill. We're not talking about great big things you've got to do differently. It's just a case of when you come to that fork in the road, actually choosing the right path. Mm -hmm. Well, there was another element bringing about talking about capillary refill, which is the technique to do capillary refill. It's um, it's very easy. In fact, we have uh, footage. It's unfortunately not not suitable for sharing on social media, but you have footage. The initial footage that the patient sent doing her capillary refill was basically a, a fairly poor technique uh, in the way that most people would. It's, it's a little touch like that. Not of yours, the, the nose lady. Yeah, so yeah. she's asking for help. It's what we all do these days, but you need to get your patient to do a really, especially if you're not going to see them in person. You need to be absolutely sure, not kind of looks okay to me and the patient's not doing it properly. I'm pretty sure this is going to happen all over the, the place because WhatsApp, you feel like you can make the process easier, but the patient's the one doing the quality refill. And unless you are really certain that they are doing a phenomenally good job in great lighting, um, you just be. You need to be very cautious about reassuring them not to come in because remember that's the moment you've got about eight hours maximum, probably a bit less than that, from that moment, from the moment of of occlusion until you get irreversible necrosis. Mm. So, it, you yeah. Once you build that into the equation, that's one of the most important aspects. Is is th the time doesn't give you room for mistakes. And it depends what, what your background is. I know as a GP, we use time all the time as, as a diagnostic tool. Basically, let's see what happens. You can't do that That's with a vascular occlusion. It's interesting. It's a different philosophy almost, isn't it? Yeah. No, the, the philosophy is it's, it's well, anything that's, that's not 
100% reassurable, you should get them back in, back in front of you. But also I'd say a lot of clinicians don't do great capillary refill because it's different in different places. Like on lips, it's relatively easy. I'd say one of the biggest mistakes is simply not, not compressing enough blood out of the skin before you release. So that's a time and pressure effect and also the area. So I, I often find it's easier. I had a, a suspected vascular occlusion in the cheek and, and cheeks are quite kind of full and um, fat filled and, and kind of touching around here. It just wasn't that reassuring. Compressing the whole of the facial artery and really pushing on it for like five seconds and then releasing it, you could literally see the blood flood run, run, rush back in in a very clear way and extremely reassuring. Um, and I've also picked up vascular occlusion in the chin that was relatively hard to see. We could see the skin was a slight different color, but a very good firm compress and it becomes very easy to see the pink rush in and just not reach a middle part of it. Right. So, so um, in other words, you're saying that the the clinician, if it's WhatsApp or hopefully not, but WhatsApp and or in front of them, needs to really coach the person about how to do it properly. Yeah, technique will make a huge difference. And in fact, the video that we that we saw of a, one of the worst occlusions I've ever seen did not have the an amazing capillary refill video. Like it, it didn't look that delayed. Let's just put it that way. No. It wasn't clear. It wasn't a barn door vascular occlusion because on a nose, I think lips are much easier to see generally. Um, because they're usually so pink. There's also a darker pigmented skin. So if you have an Asian or a black client, really, really hard to see that with a with a video. So all of these things, um, are these become these little challenges in the road. Like you can do everything right, but you've never seen a vascular occlusion on an Asian client, you know, something like that. So you just aren't as sensitive to the to the blood flow question. What about um, th diagnostic questions like pain, and then maybe they don't have the pain? which you know to be one of the, one of the but then you, your lady didn't have pain, did she? Yeah, so that's another great, um, well, she didn't have it immediately. I do think, I, sus I suspect that if you could get the data that nearly all patients with a true vascular occlusion will experience pain at the point of necrosis occurring because it's dying tissue. I mean, it's, it's kind of weird if you don't experience anything. Um, it's quite built into our evolution that when tissue is dying, you feel some sort of pain. But I bet it's not 100%. So, but it will be up there. I would rate pain at some point on the cycle as a really significant factor. But the interesting thing is about this particular case as well is that the pain, the, the pain peaked and then started to improve according to the patient. Now, I suspect a laid back patient who's trying to reassure herself will pull out those things and tell you the reassuring stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that happened, which is it feels like the pain's getting better. Um, and hearing that 12 hours on might just be because you've gone through the bulk of tissue loss. I'm not sure. It depends as to how significant or how complete the occlusion is. But that was one of the components is that she reported some improvement, which your story would be, okay, it's post-traumatic injection, it's post-procedure swelling and it's getting better because it's been 12 hours and therefore it's not an occlusion. So it's about the hierarchy. And in, in this case, a capillary refill, I always say capillary refill is king. Um, so that would be the, the number one thing. And pain is definitely on the list, but I wouldn't say if it's completely absent that you can be completely reassured. It's definitely, I think, a very reassuring factor, but I would also look at the whole story. Was there a point anywhere on the journey where the pain was really significant? Because it might be something about the length of time, maybe mm. the you know the nerves, and I've got no blood supply there, mm. and they're not hurting anymore. I always think another thing that must impact as well is, let's say that you are the clinician and you're experiencing this problem at you know nine forty five at night. It's getting better and better these days, you know, with your complications mastery course. You know, we have a WhatsApp group that's great. You know, there are Facebook groups, but more and more people are going to bed, and getting help is going to get harder and harder. Mm. But those things also change your decision-making process because I'm thinking, you know, what if you're a single mom with two kids yeah. and you're, you're responsible for these, for the, for the children and your patient, you know, how are you going to, how, what, how much chaos are you going to have to cause in order to get in front of your patient again? So you're telling yourself like, ah, oh, you know, it's probably yeah. not, yeah. I mean, what if your brain, I mean, your first kind of on rudimentary thinking is I can't leave the house because I've got a, you know, an 18 month old and a, and a four year old in bed. It's midnight. What am I going to do? Put them all in the car. And, you know, you, you need that, that could make you look for reasons not to see, um, which is where things get a lot worse. So you you know hearing this I think will change people's perspective, but you need you, you need to go through some way of getting the, getting the right result, and that might be the awkwardness of having a client come around to your house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, um, yeah. 
or you know paying for a taxi whatever it might yeah, be yeah whatever it is getting getting another clinician who's in a better position whatever it is but you remembering that there's a very short amount of time if it's a big occlusion uh, particularly if it's something really significant it's really important every second counts and you and the the impact of not doing it correctly will cause endlessly more stress for you and discomfort and all the other stuff for the patient of course who's our primary concern but that's going to if you're just making it from your own perspective, there's a lot of good reasons to inconvenience yourself at the beginning. What about when other clinicians get involved later? Yeah, well, it's a really common occurrence with the best of intentions. Um, it's worth remembering that they can get it wrong too. So um, the the dynamic between the two clinicians is really important because usually you've got with the systems that are set up, you've got someone who's basically an expert. That's how that's how they would describe themselves. That's the role they are playing. We don't know exactly who they are, but say there's a someone who is the expert advice, and then you've got the clinician in front. Um, it can be very it's it's an it, the dynamic can sometimes make a difference in in the wrong way. Now often I imagine most times it's in the right way, like you're actually pushing people to be more decisive and make take the right action but it's just worth bearing in mind that the really the only the, the best expert is the person looking at the patient and remembering that the person who's advising you has also some downsides to to action so there might be those those subconscious um kind of how how do i limit this going on until four in the morning because it can easily do that with vascular occlusion so if you're going to be the expert and you're involved you've got your own reasons to want to go to bed and that doesn't mean that you're ignoring it, but it's like you're just looking for reassurance. Like, is the pain getting better? Which is one of the case, one of the examples here. But you also don't have the patient in front of you. So, what's going on in front of you is always the primary thing. And what I would be using that in that relationship is around telling the clinician, advising the, the clinician on how to make the best, uh, on how to gather the information for them to make the decision. Mm. Um, it isn't. It isn't, I don't think, I think it's very risky if you've got a real vascular occlusion to be, to be discharging a patient over the phone. So I don't think most of them would do that. But they would essentially say it is. And I think that was the case in this. It was, it was a group decision, but that is just because you make the decision together doesn't mean that you aren't being swayed a little bit too much by the other person. So it's just one more way that good clinicians can, can unfortunately get it wrong um, because of the noise and the other reasons that affect our decision-making. Mm. And I think that if you are, for example, on um, an expert like phone line or something where you are hearing a lot of clinicians who think they've got VOs and actually a lot of them are just hematomas, you, you might see that one too many times. You might be a bit like, oh, I roll, here we go, another warrior kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. that's a bit of a harsh way of putting it, but you know what I mean? It might end up in over-reassurance. Absolutely. Well, it's this is something that, that as a GP you're um, you're aware of. I I like to whenever I find out a patient has had some awful diagnosis, I can't help myself. I want to know what the presenting complaint was, what the story was, because I actually so seldom in GP work actually get the to to make a complete from a vague symptom all the way through to can to a cancer diagnosis. It doesn't happen that often. So when you hear them, you can collect them and make and remind yourself that really bad stuff does happen. Because unfortunately otherwise, and it's so true in aesthetics too, that you can go a very long time without anything bad happening. And um and that can make you think, oh this one, it's just Tuesday afternoon. It's not this, that doesn't not going to happen to me. That'll have such a bad complication, and and you look you look for reasons to confirm what you already believe, which is this stuff doesn't happen to me. Mm. Um, it won't be one of the worst cases. It'll just be something mild, and we're all subject to that. So, hearing it might help a few people just basically stay on the on a more cautious side and try and look for the important signals and disregard the noise because the noise there is way more noise than there is signal, and once you know that, that should help you stay on track. What tips have you got for avoiding this, taking the wrong fork in the road too many times? Um, the simplest thing I could say is capillary refill is king. Get really good at doing a, a very convincing test that, that you can see blood flow has left the skin and then refilled in the right amount of time. And try not to let anything else change your, change your decision making, particularly all the stuff that we've talked about. So that's the most important signal. Um, there are other things too, but that's not the number one most important signal. And everything else can infuse a little bit, but should never be the deciding factor. Mm -hmm. And we will link below Tim's uh, emergency reversal protocol so you can access that. 
So I hope you've helped, found that helpful. Remember to like and subscribe if you found that useful so that other people can find this too. Um, let us know what your take-home message was from it. Uh, and I hope that it helps you stay safe. Take care.